So, I just can't say what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this is uh, Mauro, and he's going to talk us about mining social data. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming in such large numbers. I was not, uh, well, anyway. I'm Romeo Mora. I this is the credit of the presentation, my sources, etc., etc., for the sake of completeness. I work for Ninagora, uh, a small uh, ISME in Paris, especially 12 years of Linux. We started a project called Elodata and Open Graph Miner to research project, uh, projects that are currently seeking finance, financement. And the whole idea of those projects is well, data mining uh, at large and graphical data mining, to be more specific, of enterprise social networks, yes, and uh, to, to be way, way more specific. The whole idea wa is to build enterprise social networks that communicate with public social networks and by mining them and create a uh, mashup. Uh, so, uh, what I'm talking here today is the beginning uh, of that project. We're still in the ba initial baby steps. And we were in the choosing algorithms. Choose. <coughs> Why? Why do it at all? I, I see you are several people in, the, in, the, in this room, so... Uh, why do you guys are interested in, in mining so, uh, the social data? Why, why do you want to see, if, if it not to be creeper, creepers about it, or, 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 what useful thing to society do you want to do by mining what people do? I'm interested in how data mining is done in general. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> data mine temperature sensing. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, uh, one thing is to see what uh, humans can't. The, m the machine can objectively see the <coughs> bigger picture stuff that we are able to comprehend ourselves, to extend our comprehension. Another issue... I have a small... Problem? Does the demo effect? <laughs> I think it's a connection problem because my presentation is on the web. What the fuck? No, don't do that. <laughs> to remember what we can't, we can. Uh, we have a real problem creating uh, enterprise memory. So our approach to the enterprise memory, instead of trying to find a solution to how, how to adapt, how to, to keep the information, our approach was to seek the information, try to, to find it when we need it. Uh, I know what's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> so, uh, and to discover what we can't. The human, the human mind cannot uh, prevail what, what we will be interested in in the future. We, before we see things, we cannot say that we are interested in those things. But we can create serendipity, create the creates finding something that we don't know beforehand. Those were the three main axes we were trying to, to find by, by, follow, by pursuing graph mining. The problem with real life, the uh, social data, there are several problems. Th those are so just a small... One is always a graph, always. Uh, I dare you to find a real, uh, a real case of so so social data that is not better explained as a graph than as anything else. It's always people or things that are in relation with other things 
and the, the, those relations are real graph-like. The, the, those graphs tend to have dense substructures. They are uh, usually the entities are the nodes are unique, and usually they are grouped by small clusters of people that have very deep relations between them and don't know the rest of the universe. Usually there are no good cuts. I mean, there are several in incredibly good algorithms to, to partition that and to, and to find patterns that exist already and that you can just take in the market. But that won't help you when your data doesn't have anything interested to be, to be mined. That, that just happens, and a lot. The, the photo here is a photo of a jellyfish graph. That's usual. Uh, a, a graph where you have a, a huge ball of mud where you just have sort of points that go everywhere and are by themselves with no relation with anything else. It just happens. There will be errors. People make mistakes. They lie. They omit data. Do because they don't trust it, or because they, they are lazy. Uh, I mean, for several human reasons, you cannot trust the graph to be objectively correct. We are not in, the, in an university case, we are in, uh, in, re in real life. So, exact matching is a pipe dream. You cannot do it. Uh, it's always f flexible matching uh, of graphs. There are an enormous case of vanity metrics. There are se several things that you try to mine and they will serve nothing for you. It's still, it's worth it. Sorry if I'm... <laughs> number, uh, an example is the number of followers on Twitter. Uh, it serves no purpose. You, you can be Justin Bieber, the guy with the most followers on Twitter, is not and very, uh, not have the enormous powers of influence. Uh, Guy Kawasaki has 30 times less followers than Justin Bieber, and yet he's way more retweeted in Twitter than Justin Bieber. So it's not because a number is bigger that it is, means something. Our approach to data mining was to go all the way graphs. They are, sorry, if you were just interested in data mining in general, the more usual approach to data mining is logical induction. We did not do that at all, so I'm not here to talk about it on the graph that room. Uh, my, my whole point here is to talk about graphical induction. So, uh, why use graphs? In classical data mining, you have no techniques. You have algorithms that work. Uh, that are the, the industry standards. You, you have uh, Waka, you have uh, Mahout that have several algorithms already implemented. You just use them. It's commodity. And they're they good. They're good algorithms. All your structures are translated. You have uh, your social graph and you have a translation cost. You have to translate it to a, to a, to a to a Bayesian, Bayesian network or something like that. You have a context switching. The person doing the implementation needs to have the graph in mind and needs to have the real, which is the real data set he will use in mind. You have enquad conversion formats that are real feature envy. I mean, at some point, your graph, uh, your, your tables will just really, really, really seem like graphs. Anyway. And you have uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, On the graph side of uh, graph side of things, well, data is already graph rich, so you you're not really converting things. You're working on the data itself, and you're producing graphs as an outside, and the, the whole beautiful part of things is that your product becomes mineable himself because it just enriches the data. So you, you can mine the results of your mining. 
but your basic uh, your basic, basic uh, operation is compare isomorphisms. You you compare patterns of graphs, and that's NP complete. So a naive approach, just trying to do uh, that in the entire graph, will just take centuries. You you can't do it. So you can uh, it, it, the only way to do it is uh, is taking the heuristic. Is using the risk consideration, so we will lose something. Uh, there is no free lunch on classical data mining. Uh, you lose it because in converting, you lose, you have information losses, or you have an exponential explosion uh, of size. Uh, it's your pick. In data graphs, you lose because you d will do heuristics, so you will forget things. You, there are paths that you will not, you will not cross. That's normal. <laughs> well, when I say mining, several people talk about extraction. Extraction, uh, I, I'll just go very quickly over extraction. It's the easiest part. I, I'm not here to talk about extraction at all. Uh, the social networks provide APIs, but stable APIs. <laughs> you have programs that, that are commodities that you can download right now on GitHub that just do just that for you. I mean, there is no real problem in finding the data itself. There is a privacy problem. That, I mean, for, for Facebook, for example, people must agree with the fact that you find the, da the data. That's, that's the limit of the, the exercise. But there is no technical problem in finding the data. The data is there. This is an example of a library in GitHub. Well, The real issue is finding patterns on the data. In the beginning, I, I, wanna, I will just cross this because I think I took some time, uh, extra time. So uh, in the beginning, we have uh, other methods that will not cover the pattern growth. The A method that quickly came to mind is, is stepwise per, per, per expansion. In step by pair expansion, you cover your graph, you separate the graph by pairs, you find, you find pairs in your graph. You count which pairs happen more, happens more frequently. You keep those, you forget the others. And you expand them. <coughs> My AG pair there, when I spend, spend I, I find the B, it becomes a three uh, a three node graph, and that's my pattern. And after f after four 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 node or five node, I, I will stop at the moment. You have to choose. A, you 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 are using heuristics, so you have to choose the moment you stop. You have to ch put an end on it because otherwise it's infinite. Well, it's not really infinite, but otherwise it, it takes too much time. And by progressing, by, by extending and extending and extending your, pair, your pairs, your most frequent patterns, you end up finding the biggest max, maximum uh, frequent pattern that you have. The biggest, biggest problem with that is chunkiness. Thing is, if you see my example there, I start with the, those two. Clearly, I have a BDA pattern that should be, should be, should be picked. But if, if in the start of my algorithm, my heuristic picks the DC pair there, he will never find the BDA. You should you just abandon, abandon me. That's sad. <laughs> so the solution for a problem is chunkless chunking well, actually, we'll chunk and the chunk. We will make pairs and we'll forget about those pairs. For that, you need three things. For, for two, a good chunkless chunk. You need to, to find a, way, uh, a point where you stop. You choose the point. The, bi the longest the point, the more time you take, and the, lo the longest the point, theoretically, the better your result. <coughs> You have to find uh, branch size. I mean, that's will 
can predict uh, your speed the whole, uh, for the whole operation. You have, uh, when you find a number of, uh, of patterns, uh, of frequent patterns, you have to decide how many will you keep at each interaction. And you have to find a threshold. How many times a pattern must appear to be considered relevant? Those three things are parameters. You, the, the algorithm cannot give that to you. You, you just come with some preconceptions about the thing. You start by splitting. I, I took my same example with, with cause chunkiness. And I, I take uh, the approach of embracing the chunkiness. I start with the, the pairing that will cause the chunkiness. You select beam size, the, your initial beam size uh, of most frequent appearances. Of course, for to be considered most frequent appearances, you, you must respect your threshold. And you give canonical names to those pairs. Actually, you represent those pairs as being another node, a pseudo node. And that pseudo node, you have to find a unique, unique name that will represent it. Uh, and we will, because well, we will not represent the uh, the node itself, the, 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 the node itself, but the pattern it represents. It will represent the isomorphism it represents. Uh, once you chosen the the a name for each node, for each pseudo node, grouping of nodes, you expand and rechunk. You find uh, pairs that will pair with the new node. Uh, in my example here, I create the CG node. A will pair with CG. And find, and find pairs that were not used before. You, re, you re, restart, uh, you re reinsert older pairs in the algorithm, the ones that were not used until now. This will avoid the chunkiness problem. The BG there will enter in the in the algorithm, and as it will enter at some point, we will have BGA at the cost of some of, of some performers, and you keep going back <laughs> here to from level times. If you keep doing this, the. Uh, thing to bear in mind is that once you're here, well, once you you start uh, giving names to your uh, to your pseudo nodes, you have to destroy any pseudo nodes that are already there. You split them and you create a new pseudo node. I only take the, the true nodes inside it. You, know, you do not create pseudonodes of pseudonodes, or you just go infinitely. And once you have that, you, you have frequent patterns inside of graph. Congratulations, you have, you have, you have found things, data. Build a decision trace. Once you have patterns, you can use those patterns to create a decision tree. The, the pattern represents a, par uh, a, a paradigm, something. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, holy f <laughs> uh, So the whole idea is uh, we have another algorithm. This is a very beautiful name: uh, the, the decision tree of Chantley's graph-based intuition, <laughs> created by the same people that created the uh, graph-based intuition. And the whole idea of the, that algorithm is you use your pa pattern finding to create 
your decision, uh, decision tree. And that decision tree can be used to create a feature tree. The same process will give you features, will give you a decision tree, and give you frequent patterns. All in the while of not translating anything in, inside, your, inside your graph. How, do, how does it work? Well, it recurs. That, that, that's kind of normal for a graph. <laughs> you you, uh, you have uh, some way to select what, what is the most distinct, distinctive pattern inside a group of patterns. That's your, <coughs> that's your dec decision function. That, uh, you, 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 want to create, you want to decide things, so you, you need a thing to given a, a pattern decide if, if it's most or less true. And it recurs on your, uh, on your graph, applying a cheat point of your graph, the most frequent pattern, uh, <coughs> pattern algorithm, and putting it, its result as a node inside a tree. And you split your tree at each, at each uh, recursion between uh, your two possibilities of decision, yeah, false, false or true, for your, for your uh, function. Problem is, a cheat step, uh, this is not a regression, this is a regression that needs also uh, your own condition to stop, because at each step it only becomes bigger. To avoid researching new, uh, researching the same pattern an infinite amount of times, at each step you have to add the parent patterns in, this, in the in child patterns. So the the algorithm left to use its own devices will will just grow exponentially, uh, creating a gig gigantic uh, decision tree that never ends and is enormous. You have to put uh, a measure of of time or measure of iterations you, where we stop. And the whole idea is that for each each point of the tree, each uh, layer of the tree, you have a uh, you have no uh, to have graphs that are grow neatly one at a time. At, at the first layer you have pairs, at the second layer you have three you have three nodes, four nodes, five nodes, etc., etc., etc. Once you have that, you just to take a decision. You just take a graph, you take a decision, uh, graphical decision tree, and you compare is more uh, is more compa comparison at the beginning of the tree with your uh, with your graph until you find your graph inside the tree, and by deduction you find if your answer is yes or no. Yeah, was that was actually uh, the entirety of my presentation. The, I was hoping uh, I, was, I was measuring for 25, not 30 minutes. No, you have 30 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, five minutes more. <laughs> and so I I will open to your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, exponentially was a kind, well, kind, kind so of. If, you, if every time you create, uh, you, you collect uh, branches in your, in your graph and you make sure that the new uh, node layer is smaller. No, it's bigger. At each, uh, at each iteration, the node layer will have all its parents ah. to avoid repetition. And as these parents, as each layer grows on top of it, it okay, in, in, in absolute terms, the number of nodes grows, but basically the reference of the previous node grows, but then the heads get, the population <coughs> heads goes smaller and smaller until. No, no because uh, they are, oh, I mean, no, no, really. the, the whole usage we have uh, is, with, is with data that is not boundless, but for our, our purpose, boundless. So you, 
in in any way you 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 still you, you still have too much. It's not infinite, but it's more than you you want. You have to, you cannot just trust the the process to stop. I don't understand why you're doing this kind of algorithm. When I have a graph, I usually think of link prediction and kind of... Sorry, excuse me. Thank you. Okay. I did not understand why you're doing this kind of algorithm. So yes. I have a graph and I want to mine the graph. I have two kinds of algorithms that I'm thinking of. One is link prediction. Yes. The other one is calculating some metrics of centrality measures, irrelevant, <coughs> everything, so on. Oh, yeah. why, why, why would I do frequent pattern uh, mining? What is the application of this? Can you, can you yes, of course. Use? The, the it's not that we don't do the, those algorithms too. It's just I was not focusing uh, uh, on those for the, the presentation. The, my, our use case uh, for, for the frequent patterns is to build decision trees. Yeah, our use case to, to build decision <coughs> trees is to take, the, take decisions, it's to, to find things that we, we, we were not... Uh, uh, the pattern found is not a pre-existing pattern. My algorithm does not use a set of pre-existing patterns to, uh, to, to feed it in the, in the start. So when you, when you start the algorithm, the only three with the only three uh, parameters are the only, the only three I gave. So you end up with patterns that we did not predict before. And you make decisions based on patterns that you did not predict you would have. Can you, can you give me a concrete example of where you used you want to use what it looked example. like? <coughs> like I what data set you had? And I, I could give one. <laughs> because I applied this kind of technique at the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s. Uh, for generating not at all graphs, but dialogues by thought. And the goal was being a database made of attributes and information about uh, tourist uh, things you can visit or uh, to generate the dialogue with a human which would bring the human the fastest possible to the right solution for him as a touristic visit. So it was building a decision tree from a, a graph of touristic activities and their uh, characteristics. So it was to speak about that database. And oh. it proved very efficient. You have still a few things to, to manage, but it, it really works. You can take a database and build a decision tree to speak about what are the most uh, discriminant things, the most efficient things, to choose something you need within that that that, that, that work. Uh, my my use case was, or my first use case, my first, my first puck. The, the the idea was to find some center of interests and use those center of interests as uh, to to build decision trees to find if other people share the same center of interests. What data set? On well, well uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc., etc. Social networks, not exactly say Facebook, Twitter, uh, enterprise social networks. Uh, the, the the product we were we were building. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.